Hello, this is Mark Sandy. Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm the chief economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two colleagues, Ryan Sweet, head of real-time economics. Ryan, say hello. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you're making everyone think that we haven't talked in about a week, but it feels like I'm talking to you every other hour on the, uh, on the Zoom. Just like old times. Right? We're buddies. The other person joining us today is Chris DeRees. Uh, Chris is the Deputy Chief Economist. Chris, say hello. Hey, Mark. Hey, Ryan. Good, Good to yeah. see you. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, we've been Zooming all day long, too, haven't we, been, Chris? Yeah, we have. It feels have. that way. So it's uh, good, good to be with all of you. Let me just remind you of the frame uh, that we use here in this podcast. Uh, part one, we uh, talk about the data, the indicators. Uh, we each give our favorite indicator of the past week or the coming week. Uh, part two, the big topic uh, this week, it's interest rates. Last week, it was about inflation. So it feels apropos that we're talking about interest rates this week. Inflation is a key driver of interest rates. So it uh, feels like... Uh, the right thing to do. And then part three, I'll give you my three cents of, of the conversation, try to tie it all uh, together for you uh, in just a couple of minutes. So with that, uh, let's uh, dive right in. So uh, the, um, the indicators, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I think for the last three podcasts, I've gone to Ryan first. I'll have to say it's been a little disappointing. So uh, we're going to go with Chris oh. this time. <laughs> ouch. Ouch. Yes. Ouch. That That's... hurts. You know, I, I'm trying to, I'm, I want him to raise his bar. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pushing him a little bit. Uh, but his bar is pretty high, but we, I think we can get it even higher. Uh, so uh, let, let's, let's, go to, let's go to you, Chris, first. What, what is your, uh, in the indicator or indicators you want to uh, highlight this week? All right. My number is seven. Oh, seven. Seven. Ryan, what do you think? Seven. I'm thinking nothing housing related had seven in it. Seven. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that, the number feels so small to me. Uh, uh, I'll make it even small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seven basis points. Oh, oh, is that the okay. effective Fed fund rate? Oh, it might be, but it's not what I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. What are you thinking of? Uh, that is the uh, yield on uh, Japanese 10-year bonds. Uh, well, you know, that's uh, pegged, right? The Japanese target their 10-year JGB, don't they? Uh, there's some float. Yeah, but, but I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, Ryan, am, am I wrong? I, I think the Japanese central bank actually has a target for the 10-year JGB they do not want it to go negative, so they target it so that it's just slightly positive. That's You're right. correct. Yep. Yes. Yeah. That's an interesting policy. Uh, uh, I, I don't even know the history of that. Do you? I mean, w w what was the reasoning behind doing that? They just didn't want they they didn't want them to go negative, so because that, that would be a problem for their economy. I, what was the logic behind it? I don't I don't even remember. Yeah, at the top of my head, I think it was to prevent them from going too far negative. Okay. And that's why they implemented it. Right. Yeah, interesting. Well, Chris, why, I'm just, asking, just curious, why, why that statistic? This why that one? Uh, two yeah. reasons. Uh, yeah. First, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to our Japanese uh, audience. We have uh, quite a oh. global audience for this uh, podcast. So yeah. um, I wanted to You're acknowledge. You're a I am, really a you know. suck up. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, What's it's pretty. Reason? It's pretty fascinating, though. We get uh, we get some details into who's listening, and it's uh, it's quite global. Um, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, yep. very interesting. Actually, so. uh, Chris, I, I need my daily ego boost, uh, and the <laughs> podcast has been very helpful in that regard. And we've gotten a few nice comments from our Japanese listeners, so that's very very good. So uh, I'm all for it, Chris. Keep, there you keep go. sucking up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> keep spreading the word in Japan. The keep second the, the second uh, reason, of course, is topic. Of interest rates, uh, uh, lot of, lots of comparisons between the U.S. and uh, and Japan. So thought it might be useful to to start out this yeah. way. Thinking ahead, that, that's that's good good thinking. So Ryan, <laughs> uh, you don't mind when I kind of throw barbs your way, do you? I mean, I've been I've been doing this the entire four week four weeks. We've been doing this podcast. I and I. My sense is I'll be doing this long into the future. Do you have a problem with that? Are you okay with that? You've been doing it for 16 years. It's fine. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. It predates the podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is fine. <laughs> okay, it's all in good, good fun. 
Yeah. Okay. And and you can you can throw barbs my way too. I, I don't think I can handle them as well as you do, but go feel free. Give it a shot. <laughs> no, I'm worried that none of us are going to be talking to each other for a while after we talk about interest rates. Oh, okay. oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. Good point. So, uh, Ryan, what's your indicator? So it was a quiet week this week. Uh, so I picked one for next week that's going to be a blowout number. Ooh. Largest increase on record. Uh huh. My forecast is 21.5%. 21.5%. Is that is that personal income? Exactly. Oh, You're good. There you go. There's your ego boost for today. There's my <laughs> ego boost, baby. And, yep. and so I, I, and let, you tell us, why is it going to be up so big in, uh, in uh, the, the data for March? So you had hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, stimulus checks go out. Also the expansion of UI benefits, all that's going to boost transfer payments. So it's yeah. all going to be transfer payments. But again, this is the largest increase. If you go back into the early 1960s, it's, it's by far and away an enormous gain. And, and I suppose that's one reason why the March economic data were, you know, gangbusters. I mean, they were across the board boom like, and obviously a lot of cash went out, um, through the transfer payments, the stimulus. Yeah, I think this one number ties it all together. Like you said, like retail sales yeah. were really strong. Vehicle sales were strong. So it all because, you know, you put money in people's pockets, you know, they're going to go out and spend it. Yeah. And that goes to the, all the excess saving. Do you see that? I put together some excess saving estimates for countries across the globe. Did you see that? I, mm -hmm. uh, FT picked it up. And uh, this, this was an estimate for the first quarter of 2021 because, of course, we don't have complete data, but uh, globally over $5 trillion in excess saving, that's saving above which would have happened if the pandemic had not occurred. Uh, you know, so that's people sheltering in place, not being able to spend their money and they're saving their money, mostly high income, obviously high net worth households. And the U.S. Is, uh, uh, accounts for about half that, $2.5 trillion. And I, I'm sure that this number you mentioned, the 21.5% percent going to go up. It's, yep, going to go up. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, I got my statistic. Ready? Down 52%. And this is, it sounds, you know, anything when you say down, it says, oh, that's got to be bad. Something's, something's wrong. But this is good. This is a good, this is something we want to go down. Down 52%. Any idea? You can give. It's not crypto. It's definitely not it's copper. Not, well, crypto is down. down a lot though this it's last week. I know you're a little yeah. you're you're looking a little poorer uh, than uh, Chris. Uh, last week. Yeah, constant. Oh, constant although zero. you're still wearing that damn red shirt. What that? Every Friday you're wearing that. What's that all? <laughs> that all about? Have you noticed it's that? Just Tiger it's, yeah, it's, oh, it's Tiger Woods. Yeah, it's his Tiger Woods approach. Right. He's trying to intimidate us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure that's right. You're right. That didn't dawn on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's trying to intimidate us with that red shirt. Yeah. Okay. Right, 52%. So I don't know about the purple shirt you have. It's, uh, you know. I know. It's uh, I, uh, confusing. Uh, <laughs> is this purple? I didn't realize. Okay. Looks purple to me. Yeah. yeah Down 52%, though. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to give you three more seconds. 1,001, 1,002. Oh, I got it. You got it. Okay. Hand sanitizer sales. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Chris, but but wrong. Is about, it COVID like, related? Dead wrong about dead wrong. No. Well, I don't know. It well, could be everything's the, COVID related. Come on. It could be the case. I have no idea. But down fifty two percent. That is what President Biden promised. Our CO U.S. CO two emissions will be down by uh, by twenty thirty. Uh, he made that promise at the climate summit. You know, with all the foreign leaders yesterday. Down fifty-two percent. Uh, that's uh, but that's uh, that's actually from the uh, from the uh, from now till uh, twenty thirty, and that's when the goal is, which is you know laudable goal. Obviously, got to get that CO two the CO two emissions down for us. A lot more work to do after that. We got to get to net zero, but at least uh, we've got a president who's um, uh, starting to uh, try to tackle this problem. By the way, you can feel the like a sea change in Washington uh, in attitudes with regard to climate change with, with the, prize, the Biden administration. I mean, go back in the Trump administration, all the regulators didn't even want to talk about climate change. 
But now under the Biden administration, they're all working uh, overtime uh, to try to figure out how they should be regulating. Uh, and of course, I'm mostly talking about financial institutions, the folks we deal with mostly, uh, trying to figure out how they should uh, regulate financial institutions to mitigate future climate risk. So it's been a, uh, just a uh, complete 180 on uh, on uh, attitudes towards climate change, in, in my view, all, all to the good. Uh, but down 52 percent. That's my statistic for the. Uh, You're right. You're, I was struck by the precision of uh, 52. Yeah, I, I was. Any... I could have gone to the third significant digit, but you know, I decided probably would be a you know false precision. Okay, uh, that's great. So let's go on to the big topic: interest rates. And uh, let me preface this by saying. Uh, I think we need to be humble here. Uh, it, it, at least uh, I I need to be humble. Uh, you guys, um, you, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but you know we uh, at Moody's Analytics produce a lot of forecasts, and and I've been producing a lot of forecasts for a long time, about 30 years. And uh, uh, forecasting anything is tough. Uh, it takes a lot of um, a hard work uh, uh, to get it uh, roughly right, but uh, forecasting interest rates is a very intrepid affair, uh, very difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, it's you're forecasting an asset price, right? I mean, like you're trying to forecast stock prices or crypto prices. Uh, I know Chris, you're really good at that, but uh, you know most people aren't. Uh, commodity prices and of course interest rates. You're it's the uh, the price of a bond, you know, fixed income security. So uh, forecasting any uh, any kind of asset prices is is, a, is very very difficult because it's so it's, it's a function of fundamental factors, but it's also a function of market sentiment, investor sentiment, and a lot of other technical factors that make it very very difficult to to get right, at least in uh, uh, in the near near for you, uh, near term. But uh, with that as a caveat, uh, let's talk about interest rates. And let me let me say one other thing, just to tie it into last week in inflation. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but the way I would characterize our the, our forecast around inflation was the following: Ryan, you kind of felt like inflation wasn't really going to accelerate much from where it's been over the last decade or so. So, core consumer expenditure deflator inflation would be you know, one and three quarters to 2% per annum over the next three, four, five years, which is not quite the Fed's target, which is closer to 2%. So they kind of fall short on their a goal of, of uh, achieving their 2% target. Did I have that roughly right? Is that, that is correct. Yeah. And and Chris, your view was, uh, uh, we'll do better than that. I mean, the Fed will do better than that. Uh, they'll get inflation up from the one and three quarter percent where it's been. Uh, to somewhere to two and a quarter percent over the next yep. three, four or five years. So, and that would be nirvana. That would be exactly what the Fed wanted. If Fed had a script. The Fed has a script. That's what they want. Is that right, Chris? Uh, got yep. that right? Goldilocks. Yep. Goldilocks. That, that's a good way of putting it. And then I took, even though I, I think the baseline, which is what your view is, is a reasonable one, and it's our baseline, our most likely scenario. I took the high side. So I said, okay, if if you're wrong. And I think there's you're wrong about lots of things a lot a lot of the time. So it's not a problem for me to take you know take the other side of this. I I thought that it would come in on the high side, you know, two and a quarter to two and a half percent over the next three four years. I'm really curious. I'm really really curious if our forecast for interest rates are consistent with our forecast for inflation, right? Because interest rates, nominal interest rates, are really at the end of the day, equal to inflation expectations, and we just expressed our expectations for inflation, plus real interest rates. So, you know, if you've got a view on inflation, it's not necessarily the case, but that also should come pretty cl close to informing your interest rate expectations. So uh, let's lay it on the line right now before we dig in deep. 10-year Treasury yield, uh, right now, that kind of, that's kind of the benchmark long-term interest rate. Today it's sitting, let's say, at one and a half percent. It's a little bit above that, but for rounding purposes, one and a half percent. It got as low as about a half a point uh, back in uh, uh, late August last year, in kind of the you know height of the pandemic. 
So we're up about 100 basis points, a full percentage points from where we were a year ago. Where do you think the 10-year treasury yield will be, let's say, three years from now? Three years from now. Ryan, I'm going to go to you first. You're going to ask me three years? I was going to say three days. Oh, you have, you have an idea for three days from now where it's going to be? That's where I'm oh. confident. I can give you an accurate forecast three days ahead. Three years. That's that's gutsy. That's a tough one? Oh, okay. Uh, but I'll give it to you. Pick uh, your horizon then. Okay. No, I'll say between two and a half and three. Okay. Two and a half and three percent. So we're at one and a half. Three years from now, presumably the economies at full employment are pretty close. Inflation is where you expect it to be one and three quarters to two. Mm -hmm. The economy is growing cl pretty close to its potential. That's kind of, you know, long run equilibrium. So you're saying, what did you say it was going to be? Oh, wait, no, I, I was giving you the equilibrium. Oh, no. No, I was, no I'm sorry. I'll go three to three and a half. That's oh, you go to three to th okay. See three, how yeah, I was thinking long. Okay, okay, three to three and a half percent. Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, and um, Chris, where where would you put the ten year yield? Yeah, that that's where I was thinking. Three, three and a half percent, three, three years. Three and a half, yeah. Okay, so even though your inflation forecast is a little higher than than Ryan's, you're still landing in the same place on the ten year treasury yield. That means yes. by implication, your expectations for the real yield after inflation is is lower than Ryan's. Okay. Fair yep. enough. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take the high, like uh, like I did on inflation, I'm going to take the high side. And in this case, I, I represent the baseline you know, view, or at least the baseline of Moody's analytics. And that's somewhere between three and a half and 4%, three and a half and 4%. Okay. So I'm on the high side of, of the two of you. How many years has it been that Chris and I have been trying to to talk you down on the ten year treasury forecast? No, I know it, it, it's it's going to fail. I, I want to tell you why <laughs> you're wrong. Okay, about this. If you look at the ten year yield over the last, let's say, sixty years, let's go back to 1970. The and then look at the nominal growth in the economy, nominal GDP growth in the economy over that seventy year period. Would it surprise you if I told you they're exactly equal to each other, to the basis point? Six. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't be surprised, right? And so the the kind of the logic for why they should be equal is that the uh, the ten year treasury yield is a measure of the economy's cost of capital, uh, economy wide, and the and the growth in the economy, the nominal GDP growth in the economy, is the turn on that capital, you know? So in the long run, stands the reason that they should be equal to each other, the cost of capital equal to the return on capital. So that means looking forward that the 10 year yield, you know, in the long run should be equal to the nominal growth in the economy. So in my view, the nominal growth in the economy, GDP growth in the economy is three and a half to 4%. How do I get there? That would be, you know, 2% inflation, or in my case, I was up at 2.5% inflation, and 1.5% to 2% real GDP growth. And that's how you get to nominal uh, nominal, uh, nominal GDP growth of 35 to 4 and that's where my 10-year treasury yield goes. So first question, do you buy that framework, at least in the time frame we were discussing, you know, out three years from now? You know, maybe you're, you could say it's going to take longer than that, but, you know, uh, do you buy the framework? And if you buy the framework, how do you get to a different place than uh, than me? What what is it you what is it you're thinking about growth or inflation? And you're already on the record on inflation, by the way. So, <laughs> so wh wh how do how do you think about it? how do you get out of that box I just put you in, Chris? Well, I guess first assertion I think uh, I think if you look at the data, actually, you'll find that the ten years is a little bit lower than the the growth of nominal GDP. So. I'll, I'll disagree with you uh, on that spread um, on, on the two series being equal over okay. this historical time period. So I, I think it, it has, over time, been below, uh, the 10-year the rate has been below uh, nominal GDP. But looking forward, uh, I would say the, the, fa the other factor I, I would consider here is uh, international uh -huh. uh, investors, right? So the... Um, right. I don't think we can look at, because the dollar is a reserve currency, 
and you have so many international investors uh, piling to the dollar as uh, as a safe haven, I think that's going to be a factor in your uh, or should be a factor in our forecast going forward. So I don't Got think we, it. we can rely on just the U.S. Uh, situation. You have to consider the global economy. Okay, so let me just make that clear for the listener what you're saying, which is actually a very interesting point. That look, the the ten year Treasury yield is not only a U.S. interest rate, it's really globally determined because you've got global investors coming in to, to, as, to the 10-year as an investment. The 10-year is the benchmark interest rate. It's the risk-free rate. You know That is the key interest rate across the globe, long-term interest rate across the globe. So you've got German insurance companies, Japanese banks, Canadian financial institutions coming in and buying the 10-year yield. And because interest rates are so low overseas, you got negative rates in Europe, you got negative rates in Japan, that that kind of puts a ceiling on the 10-year year treasury yield here. So if the 10-year yield starts rising uh, too much, then it becomes very attractive for those foreign investors to come in, even with the currency risk that they face. They they feel like, oh, this is, this is a bargain, and that's gonna keep long-term interest rates lower here than the fundamental uh, the fundamentals the, 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 uh, determined by the fundamentals the way I described it. So that's another variable in the calculation that I did not consider that that we should consider. Yeah. Okay. Ryan, uh, do you have a different perspective, or, or, or were you thinking the same kind of thing? Is that how you got? I was thinking similar process? to Chris, but I would also tack on yeah. that I think the gap between nominal GDP growth and the ten-year Treasury yield has gotten wider in the era of QE, so quantitative easing. And the Fed's balance sheet isn't going to contract anytime soon, particularly not over the next three years. So I think that's going to continue to put downward pressure on long-term rates, keeping the term premium at zero or negative. Okay. Yeah, that's another reasonable argument. So you're saying, oh, uh, uh, the Fed is now a big buyer of these bonds through the quantitative easing. QE, quantitative easing is the Fed buying bonds. Uh and uh, they're out there buying bonds, and that depresses, that raises the price, depresses the the yield, and that's intentional. That's an effort by the mm-hmm. Fed to help support the economy, keep interest rates low, support housing, investment, equity prices, and everything else. So those two factors will continue to weigh on long-term interest rates, keep them below that rate, that three and a half to four percent, that would be consistent with kind of the fundamentals I described. So if we didn't have those two factors, then then rates would be more consistent with where or I think I'm thinking. Okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll um, and I, those are really two good arguments and, and you know, goes back to why I think we should be humble because it's hard to know, you know, how they're going to pl- all play out. I will say in response uh, to the argument about foreign investors, it feels like, and I, I, I I agree with that that, that 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 in fact has played a very significant role in, in recent years, but it feels like that's going to play less of a role going forward. And the reason is that every country on the planet is issuing a lot of debt to finance their own COVID responses. I mean, here in the U.S., the administration put forward big fiscal packages, borrowed a lot of money to help uh, provide those stimulus checks and the PPP money and help the airlines and everything else. Every country in the world's doing the same thing. And there's a lot of pressure on financial institutions in every country to buy the debt of that country. Uh, so there, you know, there's a lot more pressure to do that. In fact, if you look at capital flows into the United States in during the pandemic, they, they happen, but not nearly to the degree that they've happened in in recent years prior to the pandemic, and I think that it's a significant part due to that that pressure that's coming from uh, from global, from, uh, from from countries on their own financial institutions. But but nonetheless, I mean, it's a reasonable argument. So if we take out the international buyer, what about domestic? We have ten thousand Americans retiring every year, boomers, or every day, ten thousand every day. Isn't that going to increase demand for for treasuries? Uh, I never, re- you know, that's a, fl- a kind of a flow of funds argument. I never really bought into those kind of arguments. I mean, yeah, maybe on the margin, uh, but you, you know, you also have a lot of, of, of millennials kind of approaching the point in their life cycle when they take on a lot of, you know, a lot of, they borrow a lot of money and they, they take on a lot of debt and 
you're going to see a lot of bond issuance to support all of that debt accumulation that the millennials. So I, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to argue that one too strongly, but I, mm-hmm. I feel like that's kind of on the margin. You know, I don't, uh, that I'm not convinced by that, but you know, um, uh, I, I, I think it's a, a tougher argument to make. Um, the, the other one though, uh, on the fed, um, that's also a reasonable argument. So let's get to monetary policy because obviously monetary policy, you know, plays a, a key role in obviously direct role in, in, in affecting short-term interest rates, the, the Fed controls the funds rate, which uh, significantly impacts short-term interest rates. Less, it has no, the Fed has no direct control except through QE, but it's short-term interest rate policy doesn't affect interest rates directly, but certainly indirectly, and QE certainly affects long-term interest rates. I guess a key question here is, what do you think the Fed's going to be do, doing and when is it going to be doing it? Because that also is important to uh, long-term rates. And so, Ryan, I was going to turn to you because you follow the Fed very carefully. Uh, there's been some change here recently in the way the Fed conducts monetary policy and thinks about monetary policy. And maybe you can describe what that is and what, what you think that means for, for monetary policy and then connect the dots back to long-term interest rates like you, you previously did. So recently, the Fed uh, altered their policy framework to this concept called uh, flexible average inflation targeting. Basically, what that is, is the Fed's going to aim for above target inflation in good times to make up for below target inflation in bad times. So like when the economy is in a recession or the recovery is you know, fairly weak and we have you know, disinflation. What that is, what that means is it's pretty dovish for the path of interest rates that you know the Fed's basically committing that we're going to do everything we can to make sure inflation overshoots for a period of time uh, our 2% inflation target. Along with this policy you know, change in their framework, they're de-emphasizing uh, two things. First, the unemployment rate gap, which is the actual unemployment rate versus you know, economist estimate of, of Nehru. You know, they were kind of backburning that. They're actually going to you know, wait until they see the whites of inflation's eyes. So they're not going to worry about the unemployment rate falling too quickly before they start raising interest rates. Which is a big shift in the past. You know, the Fed, when they saw the unemployment rate falling, you know, quickly, they would start pressing the panic button and arguing that we need to raise interest rates to ward off any future inflation. And the second thing that they're de-emphasizing is, uh, which is pertinent to our conversation, is de-emphasizing their forecasts and putting more emphasis on actual data. So how the job market is actually doing, how inflation is actually doing, versus you know their forecasts. Yeah. So. Uh, given that, um, I mean, given all of the of the fiscal support coming to the in the economy, coming to the economy, given the growth rates we're seeing, uh, when do you think the economy is going to reach that full employment level that you know would it, by itself doesn't trigger an interest rate hike by the Fed, but uh, certainly is a necessary condition for that to happen? When do you expect that to occur? Uh, early 2024. And oh, that's probably sounds like what? a little bit pessimistic. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. You know, uh-huh. I'm looking at the prime age employment to population ratio. So we're okay. four percentage points lower than we were pre pandemic and five percentage points lower than we were, you know, roughly uh, in the early uh, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s, which I think is probably the last time we can say with any confidence that we're at full employment. So that's kind of like my my north star, my guiding post for when the Fed's going to raise interest rates is when we start to get back up prime age employment to population ratio towards the late 1990s, early 2000s. And in, in, as I recall, the employment to population ratio for people that that are aged between 25 and 54, so that would be prime age, mm-hmm. the kind of the threshold is about 80%. So if you get over 80%, that would be consistent. And if you go back for the last three, four business cycles, that's been a regularity. You get over that 80% threshold, that's when you start to see wages accelerate and price pressures start to develop, inflation starts to accelerate. Is that the rule of thumb you're using, the 80% threshold? Yeah, give or take, right around there. Give it's or take. Threshold. And you're saying that with all the growth we're, gonna, we're getting and going to get, with all this fiscal support and all the excess savings and the end of the pandemic and people letting loose, it's going to take till 2024 
to get EPOP. Very back. early. Very oh. early 2024. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Very early you 2024. Like my yeah. <laughs> so, so three three years from now is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This is early 2021, right? Correct. Yeah, it takes okay, three fine. years. Which is, right. I mean, okay. it's a lot faster okay. than we heal from the last. Okay. Okay. If that's your forecast, then everything fits. In my, you know, I, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, inflation isn't going to accelerate. That means interest rates are going to remain low. And then you throw in your other arguments about... Um, about the uh, financial flows and Chris's argument about global capital and yeah, keep interest rates low. Okay, I, I get it. So it's but it, it maybe even sense. more extended though, right? You're maybe saying, even more, right? You're mm -hmm. saying inflation, everything should be low for an extended period of time. Or it's gonna those pressures aren't gonna build for a while. So. Well, remember our inflation forecast was on average. Okay. So, okay. I mean, this year we're going to get above target inflation okay, on average, enough, and then we get enough. some a period of you know below target. Everything's okay. consistent. I'm stubborn, but it, yeah. my forecast is consistent. Okay. No good. I, that, okay. That's uh, that, that's interesting. I didn't realize you were so bearish on uh, how quickly the economy would get back to full employment. Interesting. What about you, Chris? When do you think the economy is going to get back to that full employment level? So now I, I don't. I, my whole world's been upside down here. <laughs> my thought is, yeah. I've been th yeah. I've been thinking uh, end of 2022, end of next year, yeah. and actually I'm thinking I'm on the pessimistic side, right? I've been convincing myself that it could be even faster. Yeah, <laughs> with all the with all the uh, stimulus that's coming in and proposed. So now I don't know. I I have to. I'm gonna have to take you the weekend to here and rethink everything. All right, so. Well, okay. So <laughs> what do you? Where, when do you think the the uh, Fed will be begin to. Well, let me ask you this: If it's late 2022, when we're in full employment, that means that inflation is accelerating is is above two as we move into 2023. Yeah. Given all that, when do you think the Fed makes its first move on short-term interest rates? Yeah, 2023. In the early 20. First early half, 2023. Yeah, first half, somewhere in there. Okay, what, fine. What month? You Got to give a month. <laughs> April. Right. Okay. So two you years want the markets? From, two years from now. Two years from now. Yeah. yeah. What do the markets say? What are the, the financial mar market markets? Market expectations. Uh, first rate hike is in uh, Q1 of 2023. And then a cumulative 75 basis point increase in 2023. Okay. Which if you look at our forecast, is basically our baseline. That's our forecast. That's mm -hmm. my, by the way, that's my forecast. That's my, because I have to fight these guys uh, every, <laughs> every month. Uh, that is my forecast. So I agree with Chris. I think we get back to full employment. And I agree with you, Ryan. EPOP for prime age workers is the best way to measure it. I think we'll be at 80% uh, by late 2022. And I think the Fed will begin raising short-term interest rates in early 23. And if I had to pick a month, it'd probably be at the January FOMC meeting. Because I do think inflation is going to be consistently above that 2% target. And that'll be pretty obvious uh, by very early, late 2022 going into early 2023. Uh, the other thing I think will become patently, will be very, very clear and kind of reinforce why the Fed's going to move is, is wage growth will be accelerating very rapidly at that point. I mean, one very interesting aspect of the pandemic was that it did not lower, uh, did not affect wage growth to any significant degree, even properly measured. I know there's a lot of measurement issues, but if you go look at the employment cost index, the ECI from the BLS, which controls for industry occupational mix, it shows that wage growth remained very strong in 2020. And even at the end of 2020, it had come right back to where it was pre-pandemic. And that means feels like it means the labor market, outside of those industries that got nailed by the pandemic, leisure, hospitality, retail, airlines, personal services, everywhere else, the economy held up well and labor markets are tight, wage growth will accelerate, and the Fed will see that, and that'll give them more confidence that they need to begin raising rates sooner rather than later. So I, I think they'll be starting to raise rates, uh, and if I had to pick a month, January 2023. In fact, I do have to pick a month, don't I? Because we have a forecast, mm -hmm. and I have to pick a month. So that, that's the month. So I think that's one key difference. thing... Yeah, it's a big difference. It's a big difference, and I think the key thing for the Fed is trying to understand their inflation, how much they're going to stomach of an overshoot. And if you look at their summary of economic projections, you, know, you can kind of tease out like roughly what they think it's going to be. So right now, if you get inflation persistently running at 2.2, 2.3 for the core PCE deflator, 
then I think they're going to start, you know, contemplating raising rates. But that's that's not going to happen anytime soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Okay. You, you so, did have your ego boost. I did earlier. Uh, so your forecast <laughs> you is very give similar. Give me another to, one. I'm always. Oh, oh, no, so the, your forecast <laughs> is similar to to financial markets for the Fed. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Markets yeah, are. Markets are terrible at predicting the first rate. I know. I know. That makes that's what makes me worried. That I'm mm -hmm. like, what? but I'll have to say, I I've been at that there for a long time. The markets came to me. I didn't go to the markets. Correct. True. Correct. Correct. Wrong. True. I've been at. We've had that forecast in place for quite some time. So, uh, but uh, okay. So just to reiterate, we had a dollar <laughs> bet on inflation. We're gonna have a, another dollar bet on interest rates. And Ryan is saying. Three years from now, April of 2024, the 10 year is going to be somewhere between three and three and a half percent. Chris is saying the same thing, three and three and a half percent. By the way, let me finish and then I'll come back to you, Chris, because I want you uh, to. Oh, you told me already. You told me about the global, the global, the, the reason why you're. You're lower on. There's basically the term premium is going to be lower because of global demand. Okay, and I'm at three and a half to four percent. So write that down, Joseph, because uh, uh, when we have our podcast three years from now, uh, uh, we're going to have to settle that bet as well. Okay, uh, we promised that we were going to keep this this podcast a little shorter. Um, it seems to be the conventional wisdom, although no one has told me our podcasts are too long. But the there seems to be a conventional wisdom out there that. It shouldn't be, you know, 40, 40, any more than 40 minutes. So when we, last week we we're at 45. So we're going to keep it a little short. If you've got a different view, if you like what you're hearing, you want us to keep going on, you know, please let us know. And also, uh, I want to remind you, if you uh, like what you hear, uh, give us a review. The reviews are very important because uh, I need that ego boost primarily. But it also is very important for uh, getting our podcast out there. But let me end by summarizing things. And, uh, you know, first – Thing to reiterate again, uh, we, you got to be humble here. Uh, forecasting interest rates are pretty difficult, uh, very difficult. Uh, uh, second, they go up and down and all around. So, you know, even though we all think interest rate, long term rates are rising, they're going to be somewhere between three and four percent three years from now. There's a lot of up, ups and downs and all arounds between now and then. Uh, uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, I guess the third thing I'd say is uh, a lot does depend on uh, the economy's performance uh, here in the next uh, 12, 18 months, how strong growth is, how many jobs are created, how fast unemployment declines, how fast we get back to full employment, and when does inflation begin to pick up in earnest. And that's uh, you know, tough to gauge. But you know, you know, I think a prudent planner at this point would uh, plan on uh, interest rates uh, moving higher from here uh, over the next several of years. So with that, uh, we'll call it a day. Uh, this is the end of our fourth podcast. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, talk to you next week. <laughs>